What is it like to fall in love? To be absolutely fascinated with every little thing about your beloved. Their face, their mannerisms, their voice, their likes and dislikes, everything. Listen to these ancient words from someone who had fallen deeply in love. With all my heart I have sought you. I have treasured you in my heart. I rejoice in you. I will meditate on you, delight in you, and never forget you. Can you imagine saying all that to your beloved? How about this? My soul is crushed with longing for you. Make me understand you. Enlarge my heart for you. Revive me. Now I'm quoting from the Bible, and you might be thinking I'm quoting from the Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, but I'm not. This ardent love poem is actually Psalm 119, and it's all about God's law, the very law we've been thinking about these last four weeks. Well, let's pray and jump into this exciting chapter, Exodus 24. Lord God, this is an amazing scene being surrounded by your glory, feasting at your table, having some sense of your beauty and loveliness. And we are so thankful to you that by your spirit, you continue to give us that same invitation to feast with you and to be surrounded by your glory. And so we ask that you would help us see you today, see you in these words, to see you in our heart and to see you all around us the beautiful world that you've made, and how you reveal yourself through others. We ask this to the praise of your grace. Amen. Now we're in Exodus, and chapters 21 through 23, what Steve talked about for the last two weeks, that's called the Book of the Covenant. In the Bible, a covenant is a promise that God makes to an individual or a group of people, which the Lord often follows with a sign. And there are two types of covenants. The first type is unconditional. God promises to do something regardless of what the other party or parties is going to do. So an example of this kind of covenant is found in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And this is where God promises to make Abraham into a great nation and bless all people through Abraham's seed, who we've come to understand is the Messiah. And there are no strings attached. Now, a conditional covenant as you might expect, has conditions. And this is what we see in Exodus 21 through 23. God offers conditions. And he uses the format of the ancient Near East contracts or pacts, which were called suzerain treaties. Now these pacts had a prescribed format of seven parts and God used this format with the Israelites. The first part is the preamble. This identifies who the suzerain is. And in our case, the suzerain is the Lord. Yahweh. And God says that in Exodus 20 in verse 2 by saying, I am the Lord your God. The second part is the historical prologue. This part is identified by what the Lord has done for the people. The suzerain or the sovereign or the king who's making this treaty is a conquering king. And the conquering king has done something. In this case, the Lord conquered Egypt. And then he described what he did for the people. He said, I am the Lord your God, verse 2 of Exodus 20, who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. The third part is the stipulations or the conditions for this kind of treaty, the Suzerain Treaty. And basically, these are the laws incumbent upon a people. So for two weeks, Julie taught on what is often called God's moral law. And that's represented in the Ten Commandments, which we find in Exodus chapter 20. For another two weeks, Steve taught on what is referred to as God's civil law. And we find that represented in chapters 21 through 23 here in Exodus. There's another part of God's law, God's ceremonial law. And that's best represented in the book of Leviticus. And we might not get into that in this particular study. All of these comprise the stipulations that God gave to God's people to fulfill the requirement, you are to be my 
holy people. And we find that stipulation in Exodus 22, verses, verse 31. Now, the fourth part of a suzerain treaty is the sanctions. So these are usually dual in nature. They promise benefits upon obedience. They promise punishments upon failure to obey. So in Exodus 23, 20 through 33, God gave the Israelites promised blessing and protection and even victory for obedience. If we were to go over to Deuteronomy chapter 28, we would see a much longer list of blessings and cursings that went along with this covenant. The fifth part of a suzerain treaty is the oath. And it included a public oath made before God and in the presence of witnesses. And in this case, Moses, Aaron, and the elders, which established accountability, all were involved in this public oath. This is better than a private gentleman's agreement between two parties because the accountability would not be there. After hearing all of God's words, which included the Ten Commandments, the building of altars, all of the civil law and the promises of God, the people responded. And we see it here in Exodus chapter 4, verse 3. All the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Now that's the oath. The sixth part of a suzerain treaty is the ratification rite. The people's verbal oath was then symbolically sealed with a blood sacrifice. And this was true not only of the covenants that God cut with the people, this is true of all the ancient suzerain treaties. There was always going to be a blood sacrifice. In verses 3-8, through eight, we see Moses building an altar. And it was certainly according to the way that God instructed in Exodus 20, verses 20-26. Through, through 26. It was only going to be made of earth, unhewn stones, and without any steps. So we see it here in Exodus chapter 24, verse 4. Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 pillars corresponding to the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 pillars were also no doubt of unhewn stone, and they were meant to represent the 12 tribes of Israel, and probably they were set around the altar as though forever standing there, keeping the promise that the people would make that day. Exodus 24 verses 5 through 7 go on to say that Moses sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed oxen as offerings of well-being to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he dashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. So, if you look, there is already a book of the covenant because Moses wrote everything down. And that's what he brought to the people. God's covenant with the Israelite was, was then confirmed with fellowship offerings. So half the blood was sprinkled on the altar. That signified the people dedicating themselves and their lives and their beings to God and to God's honor. In the same way, Paul calls that of believers today. Here's what he wrote in Romans 12 verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Then in verse 8, Moses took the blood and dashed it on the people and said, See, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Now, some commentators think that each tribe knew which pillar was to be their stone, and that each tribe's elders arranged themselves by their tribe's pillar. And it's possible that even the tribes tried to be near the pillar that was for them. And then the remainder of the blood was probably sprinkled on these 12 stone pillars because they represented the people. And this signified God's gracious conferring of the Lord's favor on them, sealing God's promises made to them. The people would be able to visit these pillars at any time and be reminded both of their promises to God and God's covenant made with each of them sealed in blood on the altar and on the standing stones. Because God is our creator, and we are God's created ones, the Lord is actually not obligated at all 
to enter into a contract or a pact with us. It is we who are morally obligated to render to God obedience because we owe God our very existence. The Lord has authority over us, and we are dependent on God. So it is by God's grace, the giving of God's undeserved favor, that the Lord initiates even a conditional covenant with us. God, out of God's own goodness of heart, out of God's own love for people, reached out to make a covenant with you and me and with God's own people. So here the sprinkling of blood from one sacrifice on both the altar and the people showed that God and the people were mutually bound by the one covenant. God to support, defend, and save, and the people to reverence, love, and obey. Now, back in Exodus 19, God had invited the entire nation of Israel to come up to meet with God at the sound of the ram's horn. And ordinarily, a suzerain treaty was made between the sovereign and his vassal kings, not between the sovereign and the masses of the people, but God had told all of Israel that God intended for them to be a nation of priests. God intended to have a covenant relationship with each individual Israelite, treating each person as though they were a vassal king, just as God intends to have a covenant relationship with you and me today. But the Israelites gave in to their terrible fear of God. So when the time came, they begged Moses to go in their stead. The Lord never forces anyone to love God or to obey God, but simply gives God's invitation to come. So because the people demurred and sent Moses in their stead, the final ratification of the suzerain treaty with God would have a limited guest list. In verses 1 through 2, we read that God said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship at a distance. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. So then after the ratification rite, this smaller company of willing men began to ascend Mount Horeb along with Aaron's oldest sons, Nadab and Abihu, because they were going to become high priests along with their father. Once they arrived at the appointed place, God gave them a vision of the Lord. We read it here in verse 10. And they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet there was something like a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. Wow! A similar vision of God was given to the Apostle John thousands of years later, who wrote about it in Revelation chapter 4, verses 2-3. through three. Here's what he wrote. At once I was in the Spirit, and there in heaven stood a throne, with one seated on the throne, and the one seated there looks like a jasper and carnelian, and around the throne is a rainbow that looks like an emerald. Do you hear the similar language? Sapphires come in all colors, actually, a rainbow of colors. And it's likely that Moses, Aaron, and the elders and priests recognized God's beauty and God's purity and God's glory as shining gems, clear as the sky. The very next verse in this chapter explains how this small company survived to tell the tale. Verse 11 says, God did not lay God's hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. Also they beheld God, and they ate and drank, feasting at God's table. Such a remarkable experience. I wish I could imagine it. There are other references in the Bible of people marveling at having seen God and not dying. Moses saw God's glory when he was tucked in the cleft of the rock, and remember God showed Moses his receding glory. And Hagar saw God as well. So it is safe to assume that on this occasion, the Lord revealed a part of God's glory, but not God's face. How often has God taken your breath away with the sense of the Lord's nearness and loveliness? Consider how intimate this feast was with God's glory all around. This should have preserved Aaron and the elders from any incentive towards idolatry because even an image of gold could never begin to compare with what God showed them 
that day. And thinking about this scene made me wonder how the Lord is protecting you and me from worshiping anything less than God today. Well, that brings us to the seventh part of a suzerain treaty, and that's the formal copies. This was usually found in two formal copies. One was for the vassals and one for the sovereign lord, because, of course, a conquering king was going to go back at some point to their capital city, and their vassals, wherever they were and however wherever they were placed, would have their own capital cities and their own mausoleums to put such relics in. So these copies were to be kept in public places where they could be referred to in the event of a dispute. And they were supposed to be read at regular intervals to refresh the memory of the contents. And there's archaeological evidence of this from the Assyrians and the Babylonians to their conquered peoples. And so we read with God in verse 12, The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So God invited Moses to come even farther up the mountain to stay while God would prepare these two copies of the covenant on tablets of stone. And each tablet would contain all the law, one copy symbolically for God and one for the people. Eventually, both copies of the law would end up in the Ark of the Covenant under the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. Just as an aside, we often see the Ten Commandments written on two tablets of stone, and we see the first five on one side and the second five on the other side. But in actuality, the Ten Commandments and everything else would have been chiseled on both pieces of stone because these were going to be the formal copies that comprised the seventh aspect of a suzerain treaty. After making sure that the 70 elders were well cared for under Aaron and Hur, Moses and Joshua climbed higher up the mountain. Together they waited for the Lord until the seventh day when Moses went on alone to enter into communion with God for 40 days and 40 nights. Now the people could see from far away that something incredible was happening. We find that out in verses 16 and 17. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. So they had seen the clouds settle on the mountain. They had heard the thunder of God's voice speaking to Moses. And when Moses entered into the cloud, they had seen the flash of God's fire. To those who were far away, that sight had to be scary enough. Think of the courage it took Moses to enter into this final part of the suzerain treaty with the almighty sovereign of the universe to walk straight into the fiery blaze of God's holiness. Yet God had given Moses and Joshua and Aaron and his sons and all the elders a breathtaking vision of the Lord. Beautiful, pure, awe-inspiring. And as they feasted with the sovereign of the universe, they were surrounded by this otherworldly glory, the glory that fills heaven. And God's Shekinah, the fire and cloud that led the people, the refiner's fire that purifies the gold and burns away the dross, was what they had entered into. And that brings us to a truth. There are a lot of truths that this chapter talks about, but here's a truth that I think we can take with us. The Lord's invitation to come closer brings intimacy and revelation and frankly surrounds us with God's glory. It is a glorious invitation and frankly it's also a scary one. The deeper you and I go with God the closer we approach to God's glory and that is just what the Apostle Paul was teaching in his letter to the Romans particularly in chapter 8 where he tells us that love for God and being called by God guarantees the inner working of God to conform us to Jesus, to be justified, and to be glorified. Later, Paul summed up our response. He said it in, in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We'll see it, we'll discern it, because we will have been changed 
and we will now have the capacity to recognize what's good and acceptable and perfect. The deeper you and I go with God, the more we're going to experience God's beauty and God's grandeur, God's love and God's holiness, and intimacy with God in love. How much do you and I long to know God? Enough to go deeper when God calls us? Because going deeper with God means taking time and effort to be with God. You see, Moses, Joshua, Aaron, the priests, all the elders, they had to take quite a hike up that mountain. But the reward of feasting with God at God's banquet table and being given a heavenly vision of God more than made up for all of the effort and time it took. It is really sad that all the people had been invited, but that most declined, and that they would rather send only their representatives. And I wonder if it's possible you and I do that too sometimes today. Going deeper with God is going to mean resisting cultural and societal pressures. And for Aaron, it was going to mean resisting the people's cry to make an idol. We're going to read about that in Exodus 32. And finally, going deeper with God often is going to mean being patient. In verse 13, Moses' willing and faithful companion Joshua was content to be with Moses when he needed him and to pray and to wait for Moses when God called Moses to be alone. As I thought about all that, I wondered how good of a spiritual friend I am to the partners in my life. Because you see, Joshua had no way of knowing how long Moses was going to be away. Nobody told him. He simply waited, and he prayed, and he trusted that all would turn out as God intended at the appointed time. Now the ancient Israelites fell in love with God and with God's law, and they knew, as the ancient psalmist knew, that God's love was all about God. That having a relationship with God meant knowing God intimately through God's words and living by them. And I guess the question for you and me today is, how committed are we to saying, along with the Israelites, everything the Lord has said, we will do, and then relying on God's Holy Spirit to make us able? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for being with us. Thank you for filling us with your Spirit. Thank you for giving us your words and preserving them. Thank you for being a good and loving and righteous and just Father who makes sure that all goes well with us 